Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Nest Hacker. So, are you ready to start making NES games but don't know the first thing about 6502 assembly? Well, buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a crash course. I'm not going to lie, there is no way that I can teach you everything about 6502 assembly programming in a single video. The only real way to get good at programming is by programming, like a lot. That said, it's pretty hard to get to all that coding if you don't even know where to begin, especially when it comes to archaic systems like the NES. So this brings us to my goal. Over the course of this video and the next, I'll provide what I think are the most important concepts, perspectives, and resources that'll make it easier for you to start programming 6502 assembly on the NES. I created a demo project to go along with the video that you can use to try things out and experiment as I introduce you to various concepts and programming techniques. You'll need a properly configured NES development environment in order to make good use of the demo project. So if you haven't already done so, I suggest you watch my video on how to set one up. I left links to both the demo project and the setup video down in the description. With the preliminaries covered, we're just about ready to get started. The only thing that's left is for you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. After that, we'll have a little chat about what exactly I mean when I use the word program. Computer programs, at a basic level, only consist of two things, data and instructions that somehow modify or create data. This is true for every video game you've ever played, every program running on Google's servers, and every recommendation algorithm ever written at Netflix. That said, most programs do require that you be particularly clever in how you arrange that data or sequence those instructions. But at the end of the day, that's all they really are. Data in this context means one or more numbers. As it turns out, you can represent nearly anything using numbers alone. This has some pretty strong mathematical justifications, but it's also pretty obvious to anyone living in the modern era. I mean, you're literally watching a video that's been encoded using only numbers, being transmitted over a worldwide network of computers that only communicates using numbers. Instructions, not to confuse you further, are actually just data, which is to say numbers. But they're a special kind of data that a processor like the 6502 on the NES knows how to interpret to perform some sort of action. This is why when you open up a ROM file in a hex editor, you see just a big list of numbers. Some of those numbers are actually instructions and part of the program code contained in the ROM. So if you take nothing else away from this video, remember, programs are just data and instructions that modify data. This is an important concept for any programmer to wrap their heads around, but it's particularly important if you want to do the kind of low-level programming that's required to make NES games. Okay, with all that in mind, let's now go into some details about the 6502 microprocessor that we're aiming to program. The 6502 is an 8-bit processor. This means that anytime it deals with data, it does so using 8-bit numbers called bytes. It's not that you can't handle 16, 24, or even thousands of bits of data. It just means that the processor's instructions can only perform actions on that data one byte at a time. By the way, if you're not comfortable with binary and hexadecimal numbers, now would be a good time to pause this video and go watch my previous video on the channel all about the topic. I'll assume throughout the rest of this video that you have a decent understanding of how these types of numbers work. Okay, so the first place that data can be stored is on the processor itself, in special memory locations called registers. The 6502 has six of them, three that are meant for general programming use and three that are used to track special internal information. Because they live right on the processor itself, these registers are often the easiest and most efficient way to store and manipulate data. But they're also rather limited because you as the programmer only have direct access to three of them, and at a single byte each, that's usually not enough memory for most programs. To remedy this, 6502-based computers also include what's called the system memory. For the NES, this is a 64-kilobyte region that includes things like the RAM and the cartridge's program ROM. Each of the bytes in the system memory is accessed using a 16-bit number called its address. As far as the instructions for the 6502 are concerned, there are well over 50 of them, and most instructions have multiple ways that they can be used. Some perform basic arithmetic like addition and subtraction, while others can be used to make decisions and modify the flow of a program. But like I said before, all of them are effectively just modifying some form of data, whether it be in the processor's registers or in the system's memory. So this brings me to another key point about programming, specifically in assembly. 
Anytime you encounter an instruction that you're not familiar with, you should try to answer two questions. First, what data is this instruction modifying? And second, how is it modifying that data? If you can answer both questions about an instruction, you can understand how it operates. Repeat the process for enough instructions, and you'll be able to read an entire program, and understand what it does upon execution of the microprocessor. OK, I promised examples, so how about this? Let me introduce you to a couple of the registers that I just mentioned, and then I'll walk you through an example program containing instructions that modify the data in those registers. The first two registers that I'll be introducing are called the index registers and are denoted by the capital letters X and Y. These two registers are often used as counters or tallies, but can also be used to denote positions in large tables of data. In computer science, we call a number that denotes this kind of position in a table an index, so this is where they get their name. Each of the registers is represented by a single byte of data. This data can either be set directly, copy the value at some other location in memory, or be incrementally increased or decreased. This last type of modification is why these registers make particularly good counters. Anytime we want to keep some kind of tally, we can just run a single instruction to increment the value, increasing it by 1. We can also decrement or decrease the value by 1 if we so desire. Both the increment and decrement operations are used in a wide variety of algorithms, but for now, let's just focus on how they work by looking at an example. Opening the first example in the demo repository, we see some pretty standard 6502 assembly code. Don't worry about any of the lines that start with a dot for right now. Those aren't actually instructions and are commands that provide the assembler with additional information that's required to assemble and link the NES ROM. For the time being, we'll focus on lines 5 through 25. The first thing to note is that any line that begins with a semicolon is called a comment and has no effect on the resulting program. Comments are a feature of practically all programming languages and are used to write notes, keep reminders, and communicate intentions directly in the code. On lines 6 and 7, we encounter our first two 6502 instructions, LDX or load X and LDY or load Y. Using our aforementioned principle, the first questions you should be asking yourself are what data do these instructions modify and how are they modifying it? As you might be able to guess by reading the comment above, they're modifying the X and Y registers by loading the value of 5 into each of them. The next instruction we encounter, INX or increment X, is then called twice, first on line 10 and then again on line 11. When executed, the INX instruction modifies the X register, increasing its value by 1. So after being run twice, the value of the X register will now be equal to 5 plus 1 plus 1, or 7. Moving right along, we come across our next instruction on line 14, dex or decrement x. This instruction also modifies the x register, but this time it decreases the value by 1. Since we've only got one dex instruction this time, the value of x is decreased only once, resulting in a value of 6. Line 17 through 21 present us with two new instructions, dey or decrement y and iny or increment y. These instructions do exactly what you'd think. DEY reduces the value of y by 1, and INY increases the value of y by 1. In this run of code, we end up decrementing y twice and then incrementing it once. When all's said and done, the value in the y register is equal to 5, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, or 4. For right now, don't worry too much about that last instruction, RTS. I'll explain what's going on with it in the next episode. Instead, let's compile the program into an NES ROM and then use FCEUX's debugger to trace the program as it's actually running. We'll use VS Code to build a ROM from the assembly file by opening the command palette using Control shift p and then selecting Run Build Task. This will build a ROM in the examples directory called 01 underscore x and y. Note that this ROM doesn't have a .NES extension, but I assure you it is still a ROM and will work just fine. Next, we open the ROM in FCEUX, and after it loads, we're greeted with a blank black screen. Again, this is to be expected, as we've not programmed the resulting game to do anything but quietly increment and decrement the X and Y registers behind the scenes. To actually see how the code runs, we'll need to set up a breakpoint in the debugger. After opening the debugger, we're presented with a lot of memory to search through. Thankfully, a little bit of NES architecture knowledge will make it easy for us to find the code that we're looking for. Remember, on an NES, the program ROM always begins at system memory address 8000, so that's where our search should begin. 
The game we just built is pretty small, and all of its code fits snugly right at the beginning of the program ROM. Conveniently, the code for our example actually starts right at address 8000. Finding your code in the debugger isn't always this easy, but it's nice that it happened to work out this way. The next step is to add a breakpoint right at the beginning of our example code. Doing so will cause the game to be automatically paused when that code is executed, allowing us to step through and investigate the running code one instruction at a time. Right below the breakpoints list in the upper right hand corner of the debugger window, you should see a button labeled add. Click it to open the add breakpoint dialog, then set the correct address, check the box labeled execute, and finally ensure that the CPU memory option is chosen. These options tell the debugger to pause execution of the game anytime an instruction located at CPU memory location 8000 is executed. Confirm the choices by pressing the add button at the bottom of the dialog and then make note of the new entry in the debugger's breakpoints list. With the breakpoint in place, all we need to do is reset the game and the debugger will pause the action right at the beginning of our example code. Once the game is paused on the correct instruction, we can then use the debugger to execute each of the instructions and investigate how things change in the registers. The step into button allows us to execute the current instruction and move forward to the next instruction in the program. By hitting the button twice, we see that the program sets the values for both the X and Y registers to five, as we determined it would earlier. Continuing on, we can step through the rest of the instructions and watch as the values for both the X and the Y registers are changed through repeated invocations of both increment and decrement instructions. Upon reaching the last instruction of the example code, we find that X holds the value of six and Y holds the value of four, exactly as we had calculated when reading through the program. To get a feel for how the X and Y registers operate in different scenarios, I suggest that you try making some modifications to the example code, recompiling the ROM, and then reloading it into the FCEUX debugger. This way, you can see how the program modifies the registers when you start with different values or perform different numbers of increment or decrement operations. Of particular interest is what happens when you decrement a value of zero or increment a value of 255. Unfortunately, this was all I had time to finish for a single video, but I think I covered some pretty important topics and provided you all with quite a bit to ponder. If you're serious about learning 6502 assembly, I suggest you play around with the examples in the repository as I prepare the next video. That way you can hit the ground running as I introduce even more concepts, algorithms, and techniques. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next video on the channel. And as always, if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.